I've always been uh, fascinated by how we can uh, work out which men may have important prostate cancer from those who don't and how we can diagnose that condition in a way that's uh, as minimally invasive as possible uh, with the greatest precision. We want to biopsy only those men that need biopsying. We want to reduce harm. We want to identify those men with significant disease that were previously and hitherto missed. And we want to apply uh, rational, effective and efficient treatments to those that um, have disease. The whole prostate cancer diagnostic pathway is ripe for changing. We've done what we've done for 25 years. It misses 30% of cancers. There is a different way of doing it. And I think a combination of MRI scanning, appropriate PSA testing, and targeted biopsies has got to be the way forward. The reality is that the MRI of yesteryear it, it, it doesn't any come close to the MRIs that we're getting now. So I think there will be a gradual sea change uh, and, you know, as the publications come through, the trials that are underway at the moment will help, there will become an increasing utilisation of high-quality MRI. Obviously, we've seen with breast imaging, when uh, ladies decided that having mammography, having MR and having biopsy was a good idea, that the facilities, the radiologists were made available. And it almost is like this is the man's turn, if you like. When I was uh, starting out in medicine and in urology, the first job that I ever had was putting a finger into the back passage and firing a needle, something called a Franz and biopsy needle, into a patient's prostate gland. The finger would identify the disease and the finger would guide the needle, and the needle would go through the perineum in very close proximity to the finger to guide the needle on there. Towards the end of the 80s, transrectal ultrasound became available, and with that came the opportunity to do transrectal ultrasound-guided prostate biopsies. That has been the mainstay of prostate cancer diagnosis for the better part of 20 years. The current diagnostic pathway results in overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. So we miss men that might benefit from treatment and we diagnose men that don't benefit from treatment. We know that 30% of patients who have standard transrectal biopsies will have their prostate cancer missed by the transrectal biopsy because there is disease in the anterior sectors. It also transgresses the rectum and therefore is sometimes termed as a transfecal biopsy. There is a rising incidence of, of nasty infections after transrectal biopsies and we're seeing more and more patients suffering from septicemia following transrectal biopsies. And uh, people who are traveling more who've had antibiotics are likely to have multi-resistant bacteria and they're much more likely to get a, an infection when doing a transrectal biopsy. Uh, you could argue that, 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 that trust is such a useless test if you actually analyze it properly that the cost effectiveness of trust must be very close to zero because of all the people it identifies that it shouldn't identify and all the people it misses that it that it shouldn't miss. And in the last few years, we've become better able to diagnose people by using more guided biopsies in a more systematic fashion. So we've started moving from transrectal to transperineal biopsies and using a grid to focus where we place the needles so that we can systematically sample the prostate gland more reliably than we could ever do before. The beauty about template biopsy is that it avoids the risk of sepsis and also gives you the opportunity of interrogating every single part of the prostate should you wish to do so. Certainly in my experience, the, the diagnostic uh, accuracy or di the pickup rate for transrectal biopsies is in the order of 35, 40% on transrectal biopsy. It's in the order of 70% on transperineal mapping biopsies at five millimeter intervals throughout the prostate gland. I cannot put a patient through a transrectal or a transfecal biopsy under local anaesthetic when I have very high pickup rates using transperineal biopsies. My positive pickup rate is over 66%. Now that's much better than I would expect from transrectal biopsy, so why would I offer them an inferior biopsy? If you expose a man to a 5 millimeter sampling strategy and the biopsy is negative, you can tell him there's 98% chance that you don't have anything bigger than a 5 millimeter cancer. Right? So you have this extraordinary precision to rule out an upper limit of disease.
For those urologists who are new to template biopsies, it's important to be aware of the additional effort and, and, and skills that are required. It's more labour intensive, it has to be done in the operating theatre rather than in an outpatient or endoscopy sort of environment. It's certainly a more comprehensive biopsy strategy which has to be employed under a general anaesthetic. It takes 30 to 40 minutes. Most urologists actually have the skills to be able to deliver this. Most of the urologists grew up doing transrectal ultrasound, guided biopsies of the prostate, and they know how to use the probe. They just need a bit of direction, how to set it up with a brachytherapy grid, and to follow what are really quite clearly defined parameters in order to biopsy the prostate gland comprehensively. I think the big change has been the advent of MRI and its use in prostate imaging. What we've had in all other parts of the body is we've had an ultrasound technique or indeed a CT technique, which has allowed us to tell whether someone's at risk of getting cancer. And in fact, prostate has fallen behind many other cancers and many other organ systems. And we're only just now realizing techniques that we use for diagnosing lymphoma, for breast cancer, can now be used to diagnose prostate cancer. So the great revelation, really, has been the fact that we can now see prostate tumors. And if you go back and look in the textbooks from five or six years ago, they, many of them say that you cannot see small prostate cancers. And of of course, that's all now completely erroneous, as shown by the new sophisticated MR imaging. If you can see it on MRI, it's at least five millimetres across, usually. That means it exceeds 0.2 cc's in volume, uh, which may be a threshold for clinical significance. It's a very conservative threshold, but it may be a threshold. And therefore, you would um, identify those men with clinically significant disease who would otherwise be missed if they're exposed to trust biopsy. We've been doing multiple trials, many of which are now in the public domain and some just accepted for publication, showing the ability of MRI. And this isn't just a standard MR, it's using contrast and it's using diffusion to pick up tumours. And we now think that people with significant cancer, we, we are about 90% accurate in terms of our ability to pick up those tumours. And if you compare that to what we think a standard, untargeted transrectal biopsy accuracy is, we know that to be about 30%. So that's a completely different league. We perform the MRI of the prostate. We do it multi-parametric, so the patient gets a T2, they get a diffusion, and they get a gadolinium enhanced scan. We do it prior to biopsy. It would be uh, silly, I think, to think that you can stick 12 or 14 needles in a prostate. Uh, with all the consequent bleeding and infection, and then image and think that you're going to get something that you can see subtle lesions within. And therefore, I think it is very important that we um, only try and do these very special diagnostics on prostates that are devoid of biopsy. What we then do is take a look, look at the lesions, and then we score them one to five, five being we're certain there's cancer, one being that we're certain that there isn't, with the shades of grey in between. And we do that not only as a diagram, but also with annotated images. MRI reports have been very helpful for me in deciding when to biopsy and when not to biopsy. Uh, I do risk stratify my patients for finding cancer, and uh, when an MRI comes back completely negative, it makes it very reassuring for me that that patient does not have important prostate cancer. And certain patients I've followed up after that have never had any evidence that we've uh, missed a cancer that would be relevant. I think as things move forward, we will become less reliant on taking lots of samples, and we'll move towards targeted samples targeting the area that's been identified on the MRI scan. The negative predictive value of MRI is in the order of about 95% for clinically significant disease. Today, I personally, and probably most other urologists, would rather have a negative MRI than a negative biopsy. In fact, I'd rather have a negative MRI than three negative biopsies, such as the precision of the test and the reliability of the test. If the test has a good or high positive predictive value, in other words, if the test is positive, it's likely to represent disease, uh, then we can exploit that attribute to direct the needle straight into the area of abnormality, which, let's face it, 
is what we do for all other cancers. There is no other cancer in the world, solid organ cancer, in which we interrogate blindly and randomly. We know from our experience that when we've biopsied the lesion that you can see on the MRI scan, invariably you get more cancer, more length of cancer in that core, and potentially higher grade disease as well. And you need to know if you're going to be able to advise that patient as to have the best treatment. And that's also corresponded when we've done radical prostatectomies. We found that the cancer found on the MRI would correspond to where the cancer was on the radical prostatectomy. So it's been very reassuring for us that we can um, use this technique in that sense. For five years now on the NHS, we have had access to MRIs uh, on the patients and we actually get them up on screen and we discuss these with the patients watching it. And the patients get it straight away. They can see what a prostate is, they can see what the cancer is, and then you have a rational discussion about whether to sample it or not, uh, whether to survey it or not, um, whether to treat it or not. I'm now able to tell the patient, actually, this is something you've got to have sorted sooner rather than later because this is significant disease. We can see it on the MRI scan. It's high volume. There's high grade component here that really needs to be treated. And you can then let the patient know what is the most appropriate treatment for them, be it external beam with the brachytherapy boost or if they need to have radical surgery. On the other hand though, if a patient doesn't really need radical surgery, they're often a lot more comfortable choosing active surveillance for a period of time because they know that their prostate gland has been comprehensively sampled. Once you start offering MRI, then, um, then, you, then you find that um, patients will uh, start to um, not want a biopsy unless they've had imaging beforehand. So if you do offer MRI, it changes your pathway. If the information is in the MRI and the biopsy platform is the ultrasound, you, ne you need to somehow marry the two together. And currently, most of us, in fact, most of the papers have done it using what we call cognitive registration. The current holy grail in the prostate world is being able to match ultrasound to MR. And there are some companies now bringing out ultrasound machines that will allow us to input the MR data and to match them. In the brain, in, um, in orthopaedics, actually in most of medicine, image fusion has been the norm for a long time. The challenges of applying a, an MRI onto an ultrasound data file have been quite challenging. Ultrasound is always quite difficult to work with. There are issues of orientation, there are issues of um, deformation, uh, and there are issues purely of just number crunching uh, in order to get these files to merge. My vision of the future of prostate biopsies will be that one will take the biopsies probably in the MRI machine itself. You, you, know, you do an MRI, you identify a lesion, and then you focally destroy it. Of course, that wouldn't be appropriate for all prostate cancers, but for those that are visible and localised, that would certainly be a, a, a possible option in the future. I don't know of any urologist actually that would allow himself to be biopsied without imaging beforehand. I certainly wouldn't. So I think it's almost become a moral ethical issue. It's very difficult for us when we have a technique that shows us uh, prostate tumours and that we think is very helpful not only for telling somebody whether they're at risk of having significant prostate cancer or not, and that we know will guide their biopsies, that it is not universally available. I think the next step in MRI and possibly ultrasound derivatives is identifying a man at risk, whether it be by age, whether it be by family history, whether it be by raised PSA or some other biomarker, uh, exposing that individual to a triage test uh, which will then inform you whether or not the man needs a biopsy, first of all. Uh, if, the, if the test is any good, uh, we might avoid, through MRI, biopsies in half a million men per year in Europe alone.